and we learn the derived table has a syntax within the SQL itself where it will be created within the SQL and the data set I mean the result set of the subquery is materialized with a table name and whatever columns you select in the select clause of the subquery are given as a column name and this subtable can be used as a normal table it can be used as as if it is a normal table in elsewhere of the SQL maybe in the select clause maybe in the where clause maybe in the joins order by clause okay, whatever clauses are there in the SQL you can use this derived table as if it is a normal table okay, so the lifetime of this particular table is up to the query execution and which space it occupies it occupies the full space of the user because it is intermediately created for processing the data within the SQL it occupies the full space of the user it remains active till the query execution once the answer set is given the table is flushed off along with this full space of the query and as we are not using any DDL the definition is also not stored in the data dictionaries that is the DBC tables so there is no involvement of DBC tables so the table existence is not there anymore after the query execution let me see some question here yes sir uh, hi good morning so um, in the syntax you given in the example you gave here um, is it mandatory to have uh, the columns also mentioned for example the second example down there you have uh -huh. two columns in the uh, derived table right uh -huh. so I mean I, I completely do not know the concept of inline views but isn't it similar to that like you know if I just ignore the columns within those brackets and just give it as as my term uh -huh. would it not take that way Actually, if you have any derived columns with an aggregator, it is mandatory. Okay. Well, uh, it is, it is the best it, practice you can. If this will, I don't think without your name. I don't think without your name. Without the column specifying, I remember using uh, SQL like that yeah. uh, in Teradata. Yes, yes. You can use it, but if you have any uh, aggregated hello? columns or any. Yeah. Okay, any any derivations then you have to mandatorily give the name otherwise it won't take if all are very simple columns then yes 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 are you able to hear me Okay, I think uh, I muted you now. Now the lines are clear. Is can anyone respond? Are you able to hear me? Clear? No. Okay. Fine. So everyone able to hear me, Simpush? So maybe I mean I'm unmuting you. We are getting echo. That's where we are getting problem. So please fix your headphones properly so that we can have a clear chart. Yeah, I mean, so for your question, if there are any derived columns with aggregates or OLAP functionality, okay, we have to mandatorily name those columns, otherwise it won't act. Yeah, Iqbal. Uh, hi, Manor. Uh, what is the difference between materialized view and materialized table? Just a moment. So, what was your question, Iqbal? Uh, I was asking, you know, what is the difference between materialized view and materialized table? Materialized view concept is not there here. 
just just a moment so those are two different things you are saying right Yeah. So, come to materialized view. Okay, there is no concept of materialized view here. Okay, here we call that as a join index. Okay, we will come to that join index when we start our performance tuning concepts. Okay, so, where we have to refresh okay, manually the data in the materialized view, but here it is automatic. Yeah, I will tell you that concept in uh, join index. Thank you. Okay. Yeah. So we we'll see the other type of table called volatile table. Okay, this is one more type of table in Teradata which has some extensive properties. So these are local to this session. And what is a session first of all? Session is yeah, for example, if you have logged in through any of the client tool or server tools through your username and password, until you exit out of that particular client tool, that is called a session. You can assume this as a session. Yeah, for example, in a skill assistant, I have connected with a username and password. Till I exit from the session, yeah, I can have a complete session through which I can communicate with the server. So that is called as a session. So when I say the volatile table is local to a session, that is after logging in, if I create a volatile table that can be used as a normal table till the end of the session, till I exit from out of the SQL Assistant tool or any other tool, whichever I have logged in. So it exists throughout the entire session, not just a single query. In derived table, we have seen the derived table exists only up to the query execution, okay? but not throughout the session. But here, volatile table exists for entire session and must be explicitly created using the create volatile table syntax. Okay? So there is a syntax to create a volatile table. It is not automatic within the SQL syntax. We have a proper syntax called create volatile table, table name, column names, primary index and some other keywords also. Okay. And it is discarded automatically at the end of the session. Once you exit the session, the table and the data, the definition, everything is plus up because everything is stored in the spool space. The volatile table again occupies the spool space. So, it is discarded automatically at the end of the session. Once you exit out of the session, it is automatically dropped off. And this table is not stored in the data dictionaries. Okay, so, there is no involvement of DBC tables to track the existence of the table or the access of the table. Then there is no presence of this table in the data dictionary. You just create it. They are active throughout the session and once you come out of the session, it will be flushed off. No one knows that a table was existing at that moment. And the data is materialized in which space? The full space. The definition is kept in the cache memory. And in a single session, you can have up to 1000 volatile tables. This is maximum limit of the volatile tables what you can have in a single session. And what is the purpose of this volatile table? Okay, when we use this, if we have a complex calculation, 
okay, which is result of very complex calculation or any aggregation or OLAP functionality. And if you have to use this result many times within the session in different SQLs, what we generally do, we will write a subquery to calculate that complex calculation and we use this subquery in all the SQLs throughout the session. That means what we are doing, we are calculating the value again and again every time okay? and using many resources. But how about if I calculate that value only once, store it in a table which would exist for entire session and instead of calculating those values, use this table okay, which is holding the values of the complex calculations and don't calculate it again and again. So how much optimized it is? Okay, for example, we have an average of salary to be used 100 times in your session. Okay, and to calculate average of salary, you are taking so much of CPU space, or CPU cycle. And then, it is very difficult to handle the resources. Right? So, what we can do, we can create a volatile table populate this volatile table columns with the complex calculations and then use that table in elsewhere in the entire session as if it is a normal table holding the complex values and that is the main usage of the volatile table and we have to ensure the table has very less data but the output of very complex calculations yeah, this is the usage of the volatile table. Okay, we have to ensure there should be only one row maybe or two rows or up to ten rows but all those rows and the columns are of result of very complex calculation. Yeah, but we should not hold huge data of millions of millions of data in the volatile table. That is not the purpose of volatile table. Yeah, because it is occupying this full space so you should not hold millions of millions of data in the volatile table where you are keeping your spool space occupied with throughout the entire session. Okay? Again, it will be a negative point of the volatile table if you hold very huge data there. Okay? So we should, we should ensure it has very little data but the result of very complex calculation like maximum cell, average cell where it will be result of some millions of rows. Could be, right? It could be result of processing a million rows but the final result is only one column okay, like that okay, we ensure it has very little data but the data which is in the whole volatile table should be a okay, result of cam complex calculation just a moment Sorry, so someone is pinning me for uh, the link, sorry for that, okay, so this is 
okay, the characteristic of volatile table, the purpose of volatile table is to have the result of complex data. Yeah. And the lifetime of the volatile table is throughout this session. Once you out of the session, you cannot see this table exists anymore. Even after you log in with the same username and same password, you cannot see this table exists because the lifetime is only up to the session. And the space occupied is the school space. Okay. And you see this keyword on commit preserve rows. Yeah, this is mandatory when you create a volatile table. Okay, what it signifies? To preserve the rows after each and every action on the table. By default, okay, if you don't mention this keyword, what happens? It is on commit delete rows. Okay, if I don't mention this, by default, the property of volatile table is on commit delete rows. What does it mean? Whatever operation you do, after that operation, it will delete the data of the volatile table. So, even after create the table, okay, you inserted one row, for example. Okay, after you insert the row, it has to take an auto commit. And after the commit, it has to delete the rows from the table. So it will delete the row which you have just inserted. On the commit, it will delete the rows. So if you select the data from the table, you won't get any data because it got deleted after the auto commit. And if you insert one more row, again, it will do an auto commit. And after the auto commit, it will delete the row. So you cannot find any data available in the volatile table after any number of insert statements. You get to hold that data to preserve the data after each and every action on the volatile table, you have to use the keyword called on commit preserve rows while creation of the table. If you give this, the default property of delete rows is overrided by the preserve rows and then whatever operation you do after that operation, it will take an auto commit and after the auto commit, it will preserve the rows, don't delete the rows. So you can see the data after the insert the data. Okay, so this is how we will preserve the data in the volatile table after each and every action on the volatile table. Okay, so use this on commit preserve rows keyword whenever you create a volatile table. Otherwise by default it is an auto commit delete rows so you cannot see the data even though you insert because it is deleted automatically after each and every operation. Okay. And on the volatile tables, till Teradata 12, we were not able to collect statistics or draw up and help statistics. Okay. What is statistics? I will tell you in performance tuning again. But for now, just understand, we cannot do collect statistics till Teradata 12. But from Teradata 13 onwards, yes, you can collect statistics. Okay. And we cannot create and draw up secondary indexes. We cannot alter the volatile table. You cannot grant or revoke privileges on the volatile table to other users. Yeah. And delete database and users does not drop the volatile table because these tables are not belonging to any particular database or user. They are belonging to a particular session. Yeah. So dropping a user or dropping a database does not drop the volatile tables. Yeah. It cannot load it with multi-load or fast load utilities. Okay. We will see those utilities, multi-load and fast load utilities. But we cannot load a volatile table as a target table with the multi-load and fast load utilities. Okay, so these are some limitations on the volatile tables. Okay. And here you can see an example how to create a volatile table, how to insert the data and how we are going to use this volatile table. So here in this example, I have created a volatile table with some seven to eight columns. Okay. If you observe the usage is to hold very complex results of the data. You see, I have calculated all the averages, okay, all the aggregate values of the data, employee data, and I stored in volatile table. 
So whenever I have to calculate average, max, minimum, I don't calculate it again, but I use this volatile table. See here. So here, what is my problem? Show all employees who make the minimum salary in their departments. Okay. So show the minimum salaries in the department. This is the problem. So to solve this, I have to write a subquery to find out the minimum salary in each and every department. And then in the upper query, I have to find out what are the departments having equal to the minimum salary. Right? But here, I am not calculating the minimum salary. But what I am doing, I am joining the volatile table with the normal employee table as if it is a normal table. But it's not normal table, it's a volatile table, right? So that's where we prefix it with VT. So it is a best practice to prefix the volatile table name with VT, volatile. Okay? And on the department of the employee and department number of the volatile table. I'm joining it here. So department number column is the column of the volatile table here. Okay? And I'm equating the condition with salary equal to minimum of the salary. Minimum of salary is again the column of volatile table here, which we populated, right? Minimum salary we calculated and populated in minimum salary column. So the column, I'm using it here in the where clause and I'm finding the data. So here I'm not calculating the minimum salary, but I'm using, it was populated in the volatile table in the join and I'm doing it. So I'm optimizing the resources of the Teradata by not calculating the complex results again and again. This is the purpose of the volatile table and the functionalities and the process of creation of volatile table, population and usage. Okay. And there is one more table, one more type of table called as the global temporary table. What is a global temporary? Global temporary is one more type of temporary table, but it is global. Yes. When I say global, this temp table is available for multiple users. It is a temporary table with respect to data, but as per the definition, it is global. That means the definition is stored in the data dictionaries so that other users also can access this. They can populate their own data. Okay. For example, we all are in a single team. Okay. And we are responsible for processing the data of different regions. For example, we have 10 members. Okay. Each member of the team is responsible to process the data of one geographical location. One person is processing US data, one person is processing Canada, one person is processing UK data, and one person is processing India data. Okay, the data structure is same, but the data is of different country. Right? So this is a bank and all customer information we are processing. Okay, all customer information for each and every country would be in the same format, but the data is different. Right? So our team lead has created a global temporary table that means he stores the global temporary definition global temporary table definition in the dbc tables and he will provide access to all the developers who pro who are responsible to process their own geographical location data yeah, and the user one started using this global temporary table and he started use he started loading the us data there and another developer started using this global temporary table and he is processing the UK data there. At the same time, yeah, both the users logged in through their client tools at the same time and they are processing their own geographical location data in the table. And user 1 cannot access user 2 data, user 2 cannot access user 1 data because data is specific to the session. But the definition is stored in the data dictionary and you are provided access on it so you can use the definition and can populate the data so two users simultaneously can log in 
simultaneously can use the same table but different data is exist and they cannot share the data across each other so that is the concept and purpose of the global temporary table okay so coming to the characteristics the definition is stored in the data dictionary which is similar to volatile table so sorry which is different from the volatile table for a volatile table the data is the data definition is not stored in the dbc tables but here in the global temporary table the data definition of this table is stored in the data dictionary so it is a different aspect of the volatile table and alter table all the ddl functions are possible on the data structure because it is stored in the data dictionary after some time if you want to add one more column or if you want to drop the existing columns you can do it so alter table is possible because the definition is stored in the data dictionary and the space required to store the data is called as the temporary space for volatile table and for derived table what space it uses to materialize its data it is the spool space but here in the global temporary table the data uses one more type of space called temp space okay, so the purpose of the temp space is to materialize the data of global temporary table so this is the third type of space what we are referring always see here i have mentioned you this temp space right so what is this temp space this temp space which is allocated to a user while the creation of the user it uses get to it is used by the global temporary table to materialize the data for that particular session if it is not allocated to the user he cannot create a or he cannot use a global temporary table so temp space is provided to the user while creation of the user so that he can materialize the data in the global temporary table okay. so all remaining terminology everything is same maximum temp current temp peak temp and so this is the table which occupies the temp space allocated to the user okay. so global temporary tables are different from volatile table in turn of the definition storage because the definition is stored here in global temporary table for data dictionaries so alter table is possible the space used is the temporary space and a user can materialize up to 2000 global temporary tables per a session okay. in in case of volatile table it was only 1000 but coming to the global temporary you can have up to 2000 global temporary tables materialized per a session yeah and then k and they can survive the system restart because the definition is stored in the data dictionary yes they can survive okay, even after you come out of the session and when you log in again you can see the table exists the data may not exist but the definition exists because it is materialized in the data dictionary okay, but in case of volatile table once you come out of the session the definition won't exist and the data won't also not exist okay. and there are some similarities also with the volatile table what are those each instance of the global temporary table is local to a session in terms of the data the global temporary table data is local to a session and materialized tables are dropped automatically at the end of the session once you come on coming out of the session whatever data materialized for that session will be dropped automatically okay, so the temp space is released once you come out of the session the data definition is stored the table definition is stored in the data dictionaries but the data will be automatically dropped and the temp space which is used to materialize the temp data will be flushed off released and these tables also has on commit preserve and on commit delete options so whenever you create the global temporary table you have to use this keyword on commit preserve rows similar as the volatile table and the materialized tables content are not shareable with other sessions right so even though the, they are using the same table at the same time but they will see different data in different sessions 
and tables always starts this starts out empty at beginning of the session okay? so once I join I will have the table exist but with zero data always so I have to start populating the data I have to process the data and then when I am coming out of the session it will be automatically dropped but when I log in again the global temporary table exists but with zero data okay. and in the terminology of Teradata whenever you hear temporary table it default refers the global temporary table okay, but in other RDBMS we have an habit of calling temp tables, staging tables, everything is same but here in Teradata technology whenever you refer temp table it defaultly prefer the global temporary table okay, if you want to call a intermediate table okay, which is a permanent table okay, which is stored in the data dictionary but it is used for some intermediary processing then you call them as an intermediate table or a work table but don't call them as a temp table okay this is a technology note okay, when you say temp table there may be a chance that other people will understand it is a global temporary table but if all are from the same group and if you have the same understanding it is fine but if they are very much core from Teradata they cannot understand what is a temp table when you say the work table as a temp table so work table is the intermediary processing table and whenever you refer a temp table that refers default to a global temporary table okay, so please be careful at the terminology sometimes that those people may also don't know what is a temp table and all so we have to understand what their knowledge levels and they know or not don't fight with them <laughs> okay, sometimes it happens I observe but temp table okay, as per Teradata temp table refers a global temporary table and this is how the temp table is being created the global temporary table create global temporary table okay, this is the syntax and you can alter it in case if you want so here I didn't give on commit preserve rows so by default it is on commit delete rows so I cannot hold any data after any operation but here I have altered the table property by overriding it with on commit preserve rows the okay, alter table is possible and then I use this global temporary table to populate some data yeah. and I can delete the data from global temporary again you can use it elsewhere in the whole session with your own specific data even though other users are also using the same table for their own data okay, you may use it for your purpose you will have your own data yeah, I can you can delete the data whenever you want okay. the rows are deleted but the table remains materialized until it is dropped or until the session terminates okay. so the data will be automatically flushed off when you come out of the session but the definition exists so definition will be dropped when you explicitly drop the temporary table okay. so drop temp table we okay. will drop the current instance of the global temporary table not the global instance but the local instance if you want to drop you can drop by prefixing it a temporary keyword here you drop temporary table gt it will drop your local instance which is materialized in your own session and drop table without the temporary keyword will drop the, the entire global temporary table. This drops the base definition and the local instance of the table if it presents. Okay, the global definition would also be dropped if you don't use the temporary keyword. Okay? And it may fail <coughs> if there are any instances materialized in the other sessions. Okay? By the time when you drop the global temporary table <coughs> you have to ensure there is no other session is accessing this global temporary table otherwise it would fail in case if you want to drop even though there exist other sessions which are using this global temporary table 
we have to use the all keyword drop table global temporary all this drops the base table and all instances in all the sessions okay. it would also fail when there is any active transaction in any of this session on this global temporary table okay. there we have to wait to complete that particular transaction on the global temporary table and then execute a command drop table global temporary table name all which would drop the global definition the local definition and all the other sessions local definitions provided there is no active transaction going on this is how we deal with a global temporary table so we'll see some examples here by creation of by creating a volatile table and global temporary table Okay, we'll try to understand the definitions. So here it is a volatile table. Right? See, initially if I select the data from volatile table, object not found. Right? So now I'm creating it. Create volatile table, table name. Okay, you will see the best practice here. Just prefix a VT underscore or whatever name as per your client best practices document. They generally they use VT underscore, but if they have any other prefix to be used, please use that. VT underscore the tab table name and the column. First column is where care and second column is integer I have created. And I have given a primary index as column two. I have chosen my integer as primary index. Now the create it, and if you observe. I'm not using on commit preserve rows just to show you what the impact if you don't give an on commit preserve rows. I'm just creating it so that volatile table is created. Now see the data. There is no data just created, so it is zero rows. Okay. So now I'm inserting one data. Insert into the virtual when the volatile table values. The first one is the varchar, the second one is the integer. I have inserted. So one row process. See at the bottom left, then the status showing insert complete one row process. Now if I see the data, how many rows should be there? Zero. Because the default property of volatile table was on commit preserve rows. So now we are going to override the property with on commit. Preserve rows. Okay, if I create, it will throw an error already exists. So we have to drop it. How to drop the volatile table? Drop table as if it is a normal table. Drop table with tab one. Drop the table and now create the table with on commit preserve rows. See? Now the table is recreated. Now if I see the data, zero records. Now if I insert the data, one row. Now I should be able to see because I have overrided the default property of on commit delete rows to preserve rows. See? One row added. And second row added. See the data again. Okay. Now the data is materialized and it is active for this session. It, it has occupied the full space of the user and it is active for this session. Once I come out of this session, that is I disconnected from this session and if I log in again, the same user ID and same password, but still I cannot see this table exist. Thus the lifetime is only up to session. Now if I select, it will give me error object not found. So again, I have to create it, I have to populate it, then I have to use it as if it is a normal table throughout this session only. Once I come out of the session, it is new. No one knows the table was existed at a particular point of time. Because the definition is not stored in volatile table and data is not stored anywhere in the pump space. So it is all full space it is flushed off once you come out of the session. That is the 
volatile table. Now, let's see the global temporary table. How to create it? The same thing. Just use it as global temporary. I just replace this volatile keyword with global temporary table. And the best practice here is to prefix it with GT, global temporary. I'm creating the same columns and the same properties. So I created a global temporary table. And now, if you select the data, there's no data here, zero rows. Now I would like to insert data. GT underscore. Yeah, I'm setting two rows here and see the data. Two rows are inserted. So where the definition is stored, the data dictionaries. Yeah, and the data is stored in the school space, uh, in the temp space. Sorry. It's a global temporary table data is stored in the temp space allocated to the user. Okay. Now, I'm just logging in through other session. I'm opening one more session. I'm using same username and password, yeah, but you can use a different username and password. So I have two sessions active here. One session is the first session in which we have created a volatile table and a global temporary table. Again, the other session is here. If I access the volatile table in the other session, what happens? Can anyone tell me? If I use the select star from VT underscore tab one in the other session which I have created, how many rows I should get? Because volatile table is session oriented. It cannot be accessed in any other session. Right? So here if I select it will show object not found. But here if I execute in the first session no, I have, as I dropped it I create. Yeah, I've created and I've inserted data in volatile table also as well. For example. And if I select data in this session I got two rows but the same username and same password, I'm accessing the volatile table in other session, you see object not form. So here you are getting the data, the same username and same password, but here object not form for volatile table. Okay, because the definition is not stored and the data is also not stored anywhere, you cannot access volatile table in other session even though the username and password is same. Come to the global temple. So here, I able to access the data. Yeah. And if I use the same query here in the next session, what is expected? Would you get an error object not found or would you get an empty table or would you get the data with two records? Three options. What is the answer? Can anyone? Yes. I have created a global temporary table in one session. I have populated the data. Okay. And I am trying to access this global temporary table in another session. What is the result? Anyone? You are able to hear me? Can anyone respond please? Are you able to hear me? Yeah, 
Yes, yeah, Santosh. Yeah, it, it gives empty table, but uh, I think everybody is uh, muted, uh, Manohar. Yeah, Can muted, muted I know. Yeah, oh, they are typing, okay, they just typing. Yeah. Oh, the window was uh, uh, in a corner. Okay. Okay. Yeah, I got the link. Thanks. Okay, so, yes, okay, most of you have answered, good. So, as you guessed, okay, when I access the global temporary table in other session, the table exists, but you will get zero rows. See? But in case of volatile table, what happened? The table itself not exist because the definition is not stored anywhere. As in global temporary table case, the definition is stored in the data dictionary. At least the table exists, but there is no data. Here you can populate some other data. Yeah, I'm just copying the insert statement and inserting the data here from different data. CCC, we have three here, and DDD, we have four here. Now insert the data. Okay. Now if I select data here, I'm getting C, 3, D, 4. But here, when I select, what data I would get in the first session? A1, B2. See, the same user has logged in to different sessions. They are using the same table at the same time, but they are able to see different data for them. Right? Same table I am asking here. Here I am getting 1 and 2. But in this session, I am getting Three and four. The same query, same user, same time. Okay. So this is the purpose of the global temporary table. Okay. The definition is stored in the data dictionary. The data is materialized up to only the session. Okay. You cannot share the data among different users at the same time across different sessions. But volatile table, it is completely a session oriented along with the definition and along with the data. So it is unknown the other sessions until unless you create in this session. So this is concept of the tables. Yeah, I see some questions here. It's clear. Hey, uh, yeah, basically you answer uh, Manwar, so Okay, okay. Please drop your hands once you complete your questions. Okay, so I mean, uh, when I complete this topic to explain, most of your questions may be cleared. So please drop in case if your questions got dropped. Yes, Emil. Yeah, um, I wrote a uh, question. Uh, if I create a table with the same data, uh, what will happen for uh, uh, the global temporary table? What was that? If I create the same data, one uh, AA, one 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 hmm? BB two, okay, uh, for the different session, what will happen? The same data you will see in both the sessions. Okay, there is no uh, because uh, this is creating the uh, index on the second table, right? So there is no issue. It's the same index for both the tables because the definition was uh, sharing it, right? So the same definition for both the tables, you see, now I have inserted the same data set. One, two, three, four. Everything is there. If you want to delete these rows, you delete. Then the data will be similar to the previous session. Okay. So it is not, okay, it doesn't mean that you are accessing the same data. You are processing the same data in both the sessions. But it does not mean that it is the same data. We are processing the same data in both the sessions. Okay, well, can you just tell me what is the uh, real-time usage of this uh, uh, global temporary table? Yeah, any, that's what any, I... Any, any one example? <coughs> See, <coughs> I started uh, with the example, right? Just a moment. Okay. 
actually i started the global okay. temperature table with the example that if you have 10 people in your team and yeah. who are responsible for processing different geographical data and you want to restrict them oh. to use a simple a single sample temporary table they should not use their own tables they should give multiple results so we have to standardize the table which they should use so you create a global temporary table and you give the access to them so that they will use the temporary table to process intermediary um, transactions okay. and uh, like, uh, this particular data can be transferred permanently to a, a, a normal table yeah you can use it or yeah or once once you transform all the data and if you want to store it in a permanent table you can insert into the permanent table and you come out of the session so the table the data would exist in the permanent table and the global temporary session will be flushed out so we have to uh, make a query like a select uh, from the a global temporary table uh, while inserting is that so yeah yeah before you coming out of the session you will use the uh, insert select into the permanent table. okay Okay. Thanks. Whatever, whatever processing you would like to do on the table, you do it and you store it permanently and then you drop it. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah. Right, thanks. Yeah, Pudin. Yeah, your, your voice is very low, Pudin. Can you be please loud? The temporary space is different from the spool space. Yes, yes. It is different from the spool space. It is a separate space which you have to allocate at the time of user creation so that you can handle the temporary table. Yeah. Because spool space is also kind of temporary, you know, space for intermediary. This is also using for the temporary purpose. Too. So yeah. what's the temporary purpose of having this? See, global temporary table difference you found, right? So to have this type of characteristics on the global temporary table, you have to have a separate space allocated to it. Okay. So if you want to restrict any user, you should not use global temporary table. You make his temporary space as zero. That's it. You can control him. Not to use global temporary. Okay. Yeah, wait. Uh, Manoj, yeah. uh, uh, I have a couple of questions. The first thing is that uh, this global temporary table, this, I assume that internally in Teradata, it is been, uh, all of different tables for different users. So, okay, the table is same. Was, the table is same, but instances are different. Yeah, it is using the same definition, but uh, somehow it's a uh, I feel because same thing we can achieve using the permanent tables with the different uh, different permanent tables, right? Okay. Okay. So let me uh, explain you. If I use a permanent table, mm -hmm. okay, I have inserted some data here in the first session. Can I see the data in the second session? Uh, yes. But in global temporary table, is it possible? No, I'm saying the two different tables, two different permanent tables. Because if my uh, idea is, my goal is to give the access to different users uh, with the empty data on the table, then I can give create two different tables and give one each table to each user, right? Yeah, if if these two tables are three tables, yes, you can go with. But if you have some hundred tables, then are you going to create hundred tables? So uh, how are we going to manage the access to this table? For different tables. You can manage it, but uh, see, you are creating 100 tables. That means 100 tables definitions are stored in your data dictionary. So is it an optimized way? Or if you create a single global temporary table <coughs> and ask them to use it, which is the optimized way? See, I'm thinking, okay, but I'm thinking uh, in a application point of view, mm -hmm. uh, the, a, a different a presentation layer, uh, which is using this <coughs> data, data as a backend. For that point of view, how it is useful? Because uh, every time the application connects mm -hmm. to the data, data, it's a, a session. It uses the session. 
and the same thing can be if that is the case the volatile table can serve the purpose we don't require a global temporary table for that See, based on the complexity and the number of instances you require so as you said yes permanent table can also be used yeah but the data yeah. is I mean, permanent tables i'm not saying one permanent table different permanent tables and give one two three and five temp tables and give access to only those users okay, that is fine okay Okay, and if you have 100 tables to be created for different users for the same purpose then this is the way we will do global temporary. Okay, this is for the huge number of users. That's the only yeah. reason why this generator has this concept yes. in the first place. Yes. And, and one more thing okay, is so if, if the people, okay, if the team members are not aware of this concept then yes, they may go with 100 permanent tables. They serve their purpose. Yeah, because okay. have the awareness, you may optimize the application in a more proper way. If you don't know, no one will stop you to con create 100 permanent tables. Does anyone stop you? No, no, no. No, you can create it. No one stops you. But if you have the awareness on the global temporary table and its purpose, then you will choose the global temporary table at that situation, right? Okay. Okay. So, I hope I... So, but I have another question on this. Uh, drop. Uh, so you're saying. So uh, is it? Is there is a way to see what are the available instances, uh, current available instances? Yeah, there are some table uh, DBC tables, okay, DBC global temp tables uh, table view, to which you can see okay. <coughs> what all instances are materialized and how many global temporary tables are exist. Everything can get in the DBC. Okay. Okay. So I don't go into the details right now. But uh, you, and you're also saying is that active connections. What do you mean exactly? The active connection is that uh, the query which is running current running query. Yeah, current or? running query is the active transaction. I'm saying active transaction. That means. Okay. For example, I'm doing an insert and select into a permanent table, <coughs> and it is currently processing mm -hmm. the data. And at that time, you cannot drop any global temporary table local instance. You have to wait okay. that transaction is complete, then only you can drop the all instances. Okay, so uh, as a developer, from the developer point of view, then if I executed this drop command, so it's given me an active transaction error. Mm -hmm. So then, how is there is a way for me again? I need to check the DBC views. Yes. See yeah. that one. Yes. Okay. Who has created the instance, and then you can approach them to complete the transaction or stop the transaction and then drop. Okay, 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 thank you. Okay. And please drop your hands if your questions are clear. Yeah, it. <coughs> Amit. Amit. Lena. Lena, do you have a question? Does miss? Uh, can we create like uh, our own primary index on these tables? Yes, you can create. If you don't mention, it will take the first column. But if you um, create your own primary index, it will consider that column as primary. Index. That's what I did in the example, right? In creation of volatile table, I think I have mentioned. See, I created by doing this. Okay. Amit, Lena. Yeah, uh, Manor, are you get, getting me voice? Yeah, yeah. Now I'm getting. Hello. Yeah. Yeah, Amit. Uh, I I want to ask uh, like uh, is there any mechanism to find out a oh, your voice is breaking up again. Okay. Fine. Yeah, with you type your question or you send me in an email, we'll see that. Manohar, can you hear me? Yep. 
uh, yeah, can you please show us uh, different ways of dropping global global and global uh, table? That is your exercise. Where you create multiple instances and try to drop it, and how we can have an active transaction here in a single user environment. If it is a multi-user environment, okay, I can show you some active transaction. So, for example, if I drop here, drop <coughs> temporary table gt underscore tab one. So some scenarios you can see. see. The drop table completed. Now, if I access here, you will get zero results found. Why it is? If it is a normal permanent table, then what happens? If you drop it, you will get an error table not found. But here, you are getting zero rows because your temporary instance got dropped, but the global definition is still exist. And once you drop the table here, it doesn't drop the other instances okay, which you have already created. Here, if you see, you will have all the data which you have populated. Right? But if you want to drop the whole global definition, just remove this temporary. Drop table, GT tab one. Drop table is not allowed to materialize the temporary table because one instance is already existing here in the other session, so you cannot drop it. Right? So here, this session has to come out. So now there are no other sessions. Now you may drop it. Materialized template. So there are some materialized template. Delete. And you have to use all keyword to drop all the sessions. See now, drop table completed. Now if you use this object not form. See, this is how step by step you have to use. First one is the temporary keyword and then without the temporary keyword and then with all the keyword. Now like that you can do some exercises. <clears throat> the active transactions you cannot see because if it is a multi-user environment and they are using complex queries then there is some time which that active transaction will take and at that moment you cannot drop it. Clear? Okay. So there is a small topic for performance tuning with the statistics. We just start the statistics today and we'll go with the join index tomorrow. So in Teradata to do a performance tuning, they will need statistics to be collected on the columns. What is your statistics in first place? Statistics are the clues or the hints about the data to the parsing engine. Okay. That means if you have very much huge data, then you don't have hints. For example, I have an address with me. Okay. There is an address okay, which gives you some door numbers, plot numbers, survey numbers, okay, and something, something, the name of the person and the complete address, okay, the, the postal address, the complete postal address I have. Okay. Is it easy to reach this place when I have a postal address, the complete information about the address or is it easy to have a landmark about the data, a landmark about the address. For example, if he says, okay, the adjacent to Bank of America ATM in the West Zone Street, something. So if we give a landmark, would it be easy for me to reach the address? 
or without the landmark if he gives a complete postal address along with the pin codes along with the survey numbers plot numbers flat numbers is it easy then generally we like the landmarks right so even though we have a complete address it would take I mean, this complete address and you can reach the address it is not impossible but you will reach the address but it will take some time that right? may be one hour or two hours to break that address and to go reach there but if he gives a landmark that a movie place a cine theater or a bank then you can reach that particular place first yeah, then you can surround you can set it surrounding you okay so you can prefer having landmark to reach any particular address so that it will optimize the way of reaching the address right. in a similar way in teradata also if you if the parsing engine okay, when the processing engine processing the huge and huge amounts of data it would be better if you can give some landmarks of the data okay, the landmarks here in, are called as the statistics Okay, when you have the statistics collected on the data, it is easy for the parsing engine to reach that address. That means to process the data very easily. Okay, so we just correlate the statistics with the landmark and address with the data. Okay, when you have a huge address with more survey numbers and very many obliques, many hyphens, many numbers in the address, it is very difficult. So in similar way, parsing engine we also for parsing engine it would be difficult to process that much of huge data if you give some landmarks here the landmarks are how many number of rows how many null values are there in the columns okay. how many distinct values are there in the columns such type of hints or clues or landmarks are required for the parsing engine to process the data very easily so these items are called as the statistics so see here increase the font so when you collect statistics okay, the parsing engine will get some useful information about the data such as how many rows are in the table how big are the rows in the table what is the range of the values for a particular column how many nulls are there how many duplicates are there how many distinct values are there okay. all such information will be given to the parsing engine and whenever you are accessing the table the parsing engine will use these clues hints the landmarks of the data and can process you a better execution plan so how the parsing engine would use the sql whenever you submit it is given to the parsing engine and parsing engine will check the syntax and security checks and it will build the plan so while building the plan it will use the statistics collected on the table so it will come up with a proper plan a proper optimized plan to access the data so that's where the statistics are very much important in teradata tables so that parsing engine can give you a optimized plan of execution of the sql okay and what columns you have to collect statistics if I have 150 columns in a table shall I collect statistics on all the columns no because collecting statistic is again a complex resource consuming operation right because when you are collecting statistics it has to identify it has to go through all the data of the particular column and has to collect all this information so it is a resource consuming operation and after collecting the statistics, if you are not using this information, it is an unnecessary resource what we use to collect the statistics. Right? So we should not collect statistics on all the columns of the table. But few columns we have to collect statistics. On what type of columns we have to collect statistics? You see here. All <coughs> non-unique primary and secondary indexes. If it is a unique primary index, then probably it is not required because all the values are unique. It was already known. So not required in most of the cases 
if it is a unique primary index. But if it is a non-unique primary index, to see how much duplication it is there at, for the indexes, you have to collect statistics on those columns. Okay, so the non-unique indexes, whether it is a primary index or secondary oh. index, it is better you collect statistics on non-unique indexes. Okay. And then columns frequently used in our where conditions. In the where clause, whatever columns you are using, those are the good candidates to collect statistics. Okay. And unique primary index also in case the table is especially very small. Okay. If it is a medium size or a huge size, it is not required. But if it is a very less size, then you have to collect statistics to give the parsing engine the hint that this particular table is very small. Otherwise, it will assume that this table, every table has some minimum size. Okay, if the table size is very much less than the normal, then you have to collect statistics so that the parsing engine will know that this table is very much small so that it can come up with a good joint statistics. And those columns which are used in the on clause of joint conditions. Okay, so these are the columns, the good columns which are good candidates for collecting statistics. They are all non-unique indexes, the columns which are used in the where clauses and the joint, the joint conditions and the unique columns in case if the table is very much small than the normal size. Okay, and the columns on which you apply the case statements, Cooley statements or zero if null, all case variants. Okay, those are also good candidates to collect statistics sometimes. And whenever you collect statistics, they are stored in the data dictionaries. All statistics are stored in the DBC's data dictionaries. Okay, so that the parsing engine will use this data dictionary information while processing the query and come up with a good optimized plan of execution of particular SQL. How to collect statistics? See this in text. Collect statistics on the table and the column name. Okay. Employee table is the table name and employee number is the column name on which you want to collect statistics. Okay. Although employee number is a primary index, always collect at the column level for single column indexes. Okay. Once if it is a composite primary index, then collect as a combination like this. See the combination? Collect statistics on employee table index, first name comma last name. So both the columns combinedly as the primary index. So now collect on the index. Yeah, this is how we collect statistics on <coughs> the index column. When it is composite index. Even if it is a single index, single column index, you can create it like this index and the index name, only first name, for example. Could you only first name here. Okay, so you can create collect statistics as a column or as an index also in case if it is an index. But it's preferred to have statistics collected as a column level if it is a single column in the primary index. If it is a combination, then create or collect statistics as an index by mentioning both the columns of the composite index, the index clause of collect statistics. So it is foreign key where you may use it in the where clause very frequently. So you can collect statistics on department number. Okay, in the employee table, it's a foreign key where you use it for join purpose in the department number, right? So you can collect statistics here on department number column of the employee table. And if you use some combination of columns very frequently in a group by clause or in an order by clause, okay, as a group you are using a particular number of columns, then you can collect statistics on the combination of the column like this. Collect statistics on order table column, the combination of the columns in the parentheses. So that these statistics will be collected collectively together on both the columns data. Okay. And it is useful whenever you use this combination in the group by clauses or order by clauses but not in where clauses. If it is in where clause, better you collect statistics differently. 
on the customer number, on the order number, differently collected. Okay, but if you have a group by or order by, in which you are using this combination very frequently, you collect combination of the statistics. Here it says where clause also, but as per experience, okay, we generally say in where clause, even you are using the combination, it is better you collect statistics individually. But yes, sometimes you can try this also whenever you use this combination, the where clauses, okay, you can collect statistics and see the explained plan. If it is giving any differences, you can collect on both the columns together or you may separate it. And when we need to collect statistics, okay. Up to now, what we know, what is collect stats? Okay, what happens when you collect statistics? How to collect statistics? Okay? And now, when to collect statistics? Always recollect statistics when the table has changed by ten percent through the DML statements. Okay? So it is not preferred always you collect statistics, even though there is no change on the table. Yeah, whenever there is a 10% of change in the data, then only you prefer collecting statistics, recollecting statistics. Yes. For example, today I have loaded some 1 million data. Okay, I have collected statistics. Tomorrow also, I have loaded 1 more million data. Then almost 100% of data is changed. Then I have to collect statistics. But for example, on the second day, I don't have any file to process. Yeah, there are no changes, but is it, is it required for me to collect statistics? No, as there is no change, the statistics which you were already collected were enough. You no need to collect statistics and you no need to use the extra resources which are required to collect statistics. Right? So, whenever you feel there is a 10% of change in the data from yesterday to today or from last collected statistics to today, then only you prefer to collect statistics. Once you collect statistics okay, one time, then it is enough to collect statistics at the table level. You okay, don't mention columns. So it will collect statistics on those columns on which you have already collected statistics. Okay, for example, on employee table, we have collected statistics on the department number and the job code. Okay. And next time onwards, you no need to collect at the column level. You can collect at the table level so that the statistics of department number and JOD will be automatically collected. Okay, when you give only the table name but not the column names, then what happens? The statistics which were already collected will be refreshed. But it doesn't mean that it will collect statistics on all the columns. Okay, by seeing the syntax, you may assume that this particular statement will collect statistics on all the columns of this table. No. The table level statistics would refresh the statistics which were already collected earlier. And this will collect statistics on only the columns on indexes you have previously collected on from this table. Okay? So it doesn't mean that it will collect statistics on all the columns of the table, but it collects or refresh the statistics which were already collected earlier. And it is all manual process. You don't assume that it is an automatic process from Teradata. Okay, whenever you feel that you have to collect statistics on these particular columns, again, okay, whenever you feel that there is change in 10% of data, we have to manually collect those statistics. But Teradata won't collect it automatically. Okay. And if you see any complex query okay, and if you have to optimize it first, you have to see the diagnostic help stats on for this session. Okay, please execute the statement and then see the explained plan. So in the explained plan, it would show you what our columns are the good candidates to collect statistics to optimize that particular query. Okay, that is how we use this diagnostic help stats to find out on what columns we have to collect statistics. Yeah, we know.
Um, um, uh, I have a question. If I execute the same statement which you are showing on screen for the first time, then what does it happen? Does it first time for it doesn't every, collect uh, It doesn't collect statistics in any statement. Yeah, on any columns. Does it collect me say it will give me an error or? No, it, it won't so give you any error, error but it won't, name. see it won't give any error, but it won't collect statistics on any of the columns. Okay. For example, the help stats on retail.customer. There are no statistics defined on this retail.customer. Okay. Collect stats. There are no statistics defined. Okay. So once you collect okay. statistics, then it will refresh those statistics. Okay. 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 Go. Okay. Yeah. So tomorrow also we will see this statistics uh, session okay, with uh, some practical thing. And then we'll start with join index. Thank you very much everyone. We'll meet tomorrow at the same time to same link. Oh, actually, just a moment, my battery is going down. Just a moment. My method problem is not at solved actually. Yeah, I'm uh, doing his temporary arrangements, so I came out to use some other network by borrowing it. Yeah, let us see. I mean, how much we can go through? Yeah, Rajneesh. Hmm. Hello? Yes, yes. Hello? Yeah, yeah. Okay. I think uh, my, my battery got... Uh, yeah, I am able to hear you, but you are not able to hear me because of my network issue again. Okay, my battery is also down. So, we'll, we'll take up the session uh, tomorrow, the question answer session. Alright, okay. okay. No Fine. Thank you very much, everyone. We'll meet tomorrow at the same time, same link, and uh, use uh, the other performance tuning techniques. Again, we'll uh, uh, address these questions also tomorrow. Thank you very much. Bye.